If you've tuned in for any of the weekly takes total of more than a million listens, yes, we proudly passed the one million mark on our last episode. You've heard many a guest talk about amenities and experience. They're a huge part of our ongoing discussion of the state of office and attracting talent in a hybrid world. But it's also important to remember that workplaces are actually larger than the four walls where the work itself takes place. On this episode, we continue towards our next million listens with a roundtable of leaders on workplace strategy and flexible space, who expand our ideas about office and the new ways that companies are adapting and utilizing their real estate. What really is changing in placemaking is this mindset of thinking less about employees as somebody that you transactionally provide accommodation to but rather thinking about them as a consumer of an experience that you host and curate for them on site. That's Lenny Bedoyan, CBRE's Global Head of Workplace and Design, a leader with more than 20 years of experience in the field of workplace consulting and strategic facility planning. There are three legs to the stool. There's the premises within the four walls, there's the building, and then there's the neighborhood. And that's John Stevens, a CBRE Director of America's Consulting and part of the team that specializes in hybrid work. To complement their perspectives, we're also joined by a flex space entrepreneur who deals with big questions about the state and future of office on a daily basis. Is it about amenities and a great physical workspace that's beautiful, or is it about relationships? That's Jamie Hadari, the co-founder and CEO of Industrious, one of the world's largest providers of flexible and co-working space. Coming up, we think outside the box, or outside the building, that is, hybrid flex and the future of cities. I'm Spencer Levy, and that's right now on The Weekly Take. Welcome to The Weekly Take, and this week we are delighted to revisit the topic of hybrid and the future of cities. Jamie Hadari, CEO of Industrious. Jamie, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. Lenny Bedoyan. Lenny, thank you. Great to be here, Spencer. And a new guest, John Stevens. John, welcome. Thanks, Spencer. Glad to be here. Great. Well, thanks, John. So, Jamie, I think most folks are familiar uh, with Industrious, but give us a little bit more insight into your business model. How's it going? The company's about 11, 12 years old. I would say on the customer-facing side of things, the, the thing we're known for, very focused on, can we deliver a workplace to customers that's as good as if they did it themselves? And then on the supply side of the business, on the landlord-facing side, that's actually probably the even more different side of it. We only do management agreements with landlords. So we basically do a partnership with them, and we turn a portion of their building into flex space. And that's obviously a very less swingy, a little bit less risky business model than what people traditionally associate the flex business with. So in general, that did help in the depths of 2020, which was a tough time for flex providers. I think what a lot of people don't know is since 2021, it's been a roaring time in general for flex providers. For a lot of companies, what happened is either they're getting out of large headquarters type space or they have employees that moved all around the country and it's, oh my God, I need a 20-person space in Denver and a 51-person space in Dallas and a three-person space in Boulder and I'm not going to necessarily build that out myself and run that. So it's been a period of a lot of growth for the business. I guess I would finish by saying, and I think this is definitely going to be relevant to the conversation today, the only dark cloud, the only thing that I have really seen hang over the business is that the difference between a high-performing and low-performing unit is much higher than pre-COVID. And in particular, all of our units that are in neighborhoods where people can walk or bike to work are doing really well. And all of our units that are in Vibrant CBDs are doing well, but our units that are in sleepy CBDs that are empty after 6 p.m. on the 40th floor of an office tower, those ones are struggling a bit more. So as we grow our network, we're having to be responsive to that pattern of customer demand. Mm -hmm. Well, Lenny, I think that's a great segue to the question I was going to ask you, because while there's some great success within Industrious and certain of their locations, maybe some of them in the suburbs seem to be outperforming the CBDs. What are you seeing, Lenny? Well, a couple of things in that, Spencer. One, it depends on the size of the occupier. So smaller companies or smaller tendencies are seeing a much greater return to office, right? Because they're just used to working together and being together. But those large tendencies, those large organizations are lagging in utilization. It's interesting, in reporting from Castle Systems last week, 
it eclipsed with their measurement 50% occupancy for the first time since 2020. And that still is significantly off of where we were pre-pandemic. And so what we're seeing is, Jamie said, those spaces, those occupiers in the sleepy CBDs, those are challenged. Those are places that are generally longer commutes, harder to get to, less things to do after work, places people want to be less. I think people making the choice to come into the office, they're choosing to be in places where there's vibrancy, where when I come in, make the commute, the reason for being there is greater than being working remote for that day. So we see utilization still off of where it was pre-pandemic with the largest occupiers. That varies in different sub-markets, and I know John will probably have a really strong opinion about that. But I think those places where there's a better reason for people to come into the office or there's a more vibrant experience, those are seeing utilization in excess of those that don't have those attributes. So John, Lenny invited you to dig in on sub-markets. And so what's your point of view? Yeah, so this concept of the, the sleepy CBD has come up a few times already. And I think it's important to recognize um, areas that were commercial or corporate, even pre-COVID, uh, they had really down periods. Try getting a salad in Midtown New York on a Saturday before the pandemic. It's hard. A lot of places were closed. It was sleepy on the weekend, only because the, the dominant use there was office. We're seeing this sub-market, a really micro-market story emerge where when there are high-class trophy premium office buildings intermingling with uh, a balanced residential community, some retail, et cetera, that's what people are gravitating towards um, versus a, a district that is strictly commercial and of that commercial space, none of it might be top of market. Um, we're able to map that out uh, within cities to turn a, a sub-market um, like downtown Washington, D.C. or downtown Denver into a patchwork of micro markets that all have different attributes along those dimensions um, to help pick out, A, where the hotspots are now, but also B, where certain interventions might be helpful in turning the tide in some of these areas that are a bit sleepier at the moment. And for what it's worth, from my end, that just seems like the most extraordinary development because as a person in my lived experience, it's so block by block. There are parts of Midtown I go to once a year and there are parts of Midtown I go to every week and when we talk about cities or even submarkets in that broad sense, it just feels at odds with the way we all live our lives. So actually having a map that says this northwest corner of downtown Denver is hot, 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 and this one, that actually feels very real to me. One day I would love to see that map. Totally. We think about like a five-minute walk, and in a, in a micro market, or say you're going to the office, there's a set of places you could potentially become a regular at. The coffee shop, the lunch spot, the happy hour bar. That's your micro market. It's probably not more than five minutes away in either direction. Uh, you might share those places with the three or four office buildings near you, but several blocks over is a different micro market. And if there's a different mix, there's not a big apartment building in that one, it'll be less vibrant. But is that one of the fundamental post COVID changes in that the focus on a micro market within a mega market like New York, where we're sitting right now, seems to have accelerated. What do you think, Jamie? I absolutely think that. To me, the, the defining underlying principle there, the fundament is that pre-COVID landlords were able to be, I mean, employers were able to be coercive and say, you got to come in. And if I tell you your job requires you to go to 10th and 37th, you got to go to 10th and 37th. And now that employees have the choice of when to go in and if what they want to go in at all, it magnifies the distinctions between places people want to be or don't want to be. So maybe those micro-market distinctions were always there. And maybe to the individual, they were always just as pronounced. But certainly now that people get to vote with their feet, all of a sudden you see it play out in a grand way in terms of pricing and utilization and where people actually show up. Yeah. And, and I think those really matter. I mean, this, this notion of being told or the employer being able to be coercive, we're seeing so many organizations drive mandates in their organizations but the reality is mandates aren't really working. And I'll give one example. In New York, two large financial institutions, one with a declared policy towards hybrid and one with a, we are going to be back in the office five days a week. Two headquarters location, they have exactly the same through the turnstile utilization, hovering at about 40%. So while the organizations have chosen a mandate around their future policy, their employees are deciding how they're going to work and the reality is until that employee value proposition is going to attract them back, until that micro market is meaningful and it's worth the commute, 
employees just aren't going to come back to a lackluster, ill-equipped solution of going to an office building that's not fit for their purpose and doesn't have the vibrancy to really attract them in. I think the most powerful kind of incentive to go back to the office is a personal relationship with somebody else in the company. If you're a younger person, it's for learning, mentorship, apprenticeship, development. We come into the office to be with other people. And if you're showing up and you're doing the same things you do when you're working at home, but in the office, it'll feel like a bad idea. Um, You had to get out of bed earlier. You had to commute. You had to pay money for lunch versus making it at home. I think there are several areas that you can provide a return on that, that cost to coming in. But the most powerful one, I think, is between a manager and an employee interacting face to face within the margins. It doesn't even have to be for a specific meeting, but just the exposure aspect um, is a powerful thing. So on that point, Lenny, getting the senior people back in the office, not saying first, but get them back there in mass, which will draw the more junior people back, sounds good in concept, but you need to have this trust or apprentice type of relationship. What do you think, Lenny? Well, I think getting influencers back in the office. I mean, we've said this from the beginning, the, the biggest amenity in the office to employees are other employees, people. Nobody likes to go eat in an empty restaurant and nobody wants to go into an office where there's not lots of people and lots of activity. And so how do you manage that in terms of creating a real draw to others? The people who generally are more senior in an organization, as John mentioned, are the ones who have the most to share and the most others have to learn from. So creating a guide path, a, a glide path or a path of least resistance for those people coming back varies in different organizations. In a financial investment bank, it might be entitlement of space to the senior most producers and some flexibility of space around that to attract others back into the office. I think that's going to vary organizationally, but I do think organizations are being really attuned to how do I attract people back and make the choice of coming back their decision. I think the concept you're describing makes sense to me. I will say I don't see them as intention. To me, it's not, is it about amenities and a great physical workspace that's beautiful, or is it about relationships? I really believe that the first can power the second. Like, I've just, if you're at a day's in, you're probably not going to meet the other guests. And if you're at a gorgeous resort where you're having the time of your life and you feel taken care of, you're so much more likely to develop relationships. When you go to a kind of bad wedding, for lack of a better term, where the lights are too bright and the acoustics are bad— Oftentimes, looking at your watch, you're ready to go home. And when you're at an amazing wedding where the music's great and it's comfortable and the acoustics work so you can hear everyone else at the table, you can get to the end of the weekend and you wish it was two days longer than that and you leave with new friends. So I think you are right that the absolute bedrock is the power of the interpersonal relationships at work, the level of trust, and the degree to which being in person is more interesting and vibrant and powers that, which I do think is true. But I think companies that have poorly designed, uninspiring, sometimes very cold workplaces are not doing themselves any favors. And the ones that have been able to figure out how to make them inviting, it becomes a virtuous cycle. People develop more relationships. They like being around their colleagues. Then they get closer. Then they want to see each other. Then they go out after work. And now things are humming. So let's go back to that, Lenny. Let's go back to the physical space. I think we're all in agreement that relationships, mentoring are the bedrock of any great organization. But we're in the space business, both in industrious and generally in leasing. So talk to me about how the space itself can lead to the kind of outcomes that Jamie's talking about, about forming better relationships, being more creative, and what changes, if any, you have considered post-COVID. Well, I think, Jamie's that's such a great narrative, too, about the idea of creating an experience that people want to be a part of and stay in that experience. Most offices don't meet that criteria. If I think about what really is changing in placemaking, it's this mindset of thinking less about employees as somebody that you transactionally provide accommodation to, but rather thinking about them as a consumer of an experience that you host and curate for them on site. And if you do that, like any good retail or any good hospitality destination, it's apparent to employees and it attracts them back for the various reasons Jamie described. How that manifests itself in terms of space design are flexibility and choice in the office, not one desk that I go to, but a network or a venue of spaces which I can choose that creates a lot of comfort and choice and optionality for employees. Certainly superior technology and connectivity 
better than I would have in my home office, but also a sense of wellness and support and thoughtful places where I intersect and engage other employees. All of the amenities are important from the standpoint of it creates the occasion for me to bump into somebody and have a conversation in a comfortable setting, which isn't me just doing my work in my desk. So things like wellness, natural light, good coffee, curated experiences, great technology, all of these things really matter. And in aggregate, they just have to be better. They have to be superior to what I would have outside of the office. And when they are, employees generally will make the right decision for where they're most productive and where their happiness. And they'll make the choice to be in those spaces. But if you look at most offices, most offices fell pretty short of that bar. Most were designed more for efficiency than for experience. And I think when you lean to efficiency, you tend to pack more people into less space, tends to provide less space for these other things that actually create meaningful connection. It tends to give employees the feeling of being more of a cog in a wheel rather than a consumer of experience you're trying to really create for them. So, John, let's dig into this for a moment, back to the original concept we talked about, which was micro-market. I often have this argument, is it better to have the best office in a second-tier area or an okay office in a great sub-market? What's your point of view? It's a great question. There are three legs to the stool. There's the premises within the four walls, there's the building, and then there's the neighborhood. And following along these themes of the purpose for going into the office, becoming a bit more social, more team-oriented, I think it is more likely on the days you come in, especially in a hybrid schedule, to maybe bleed past business hours for a more social occasion, whether it's grabbing a drink after work or coffee before work. And for that, most of the time, you need the neighborhood. Or it's harder to do that if you go to a nice office in a bad location. It can be done, but it's more operationally intensive for the occupier. Um, And it's also more likely to become monotonous as it's just you're in your own space versus in a a vibrant um, place where you're interacting with other people. I would say most of the clients we're talking to now are choosing maybe a slightly lesser than building in a better location and utilizing the neighborhood as the amenity. A, so they don't have to build and operate it themselves, but B, just because it it feels so much more authentic. Um, So I'd take the submarket A, slightly worse building, um, although it's way better if you can get all three. It's a great question, and I feel like Jamie, the CEO of a workspace company, would love to say that like you can come up with a workspace so compelling that it can obviate the need to think about the neighborhood it's in. But I would, but I think John is absolutely right. In real life, looking at the way our customers behave, I think a slightly less than office on an amazing, vibrant corner would do better than an excellent, perfectly designed office in a slightly less appealing micro-market. And if you're a big enough occupier, you can tip the scales with this question. Let's say you employ 10,000 people or something, you're making a big headquarters decision. If you're investing in a place that might be sleepy today, but you're investing for the long term, you can make decisions like, let's not put a cafeteria up on the 12th floor. Let's find a retail partner. Let's do some public-private partnership to pedestrianize the area in front of our space. You can do things that can change a district over a medium time scale that I think are important. Um, and I think there are some areas that could really benefit uh, from that pro- proactive Google, action like that. I heard Google, I think, has talked about them, for example, themselves that way. That it's like, you want to go on vacation somewhere sunny, but when you're us, you can make your own weather. Like, And they really have done that with the deep west side in Manhattan, for example. So I totally agree. There is a scale where you can make it vibrant because you're delivering so many people and so many of those experiences yourself. Well, Jamie, that's such a great example because I've been in the New York City real estate business for 30 years, and I can tell you that the far west side 30 years ago ain't what it is today. Mm -hmm. And they created what it is today. The meatpacking district was created. The Fulton Market was created. And then there are some things that were created out of whole cloth. What do you think, Lenny? No, absolutely. I think this notion of coming back to the office What's lost in this, and and I agree, Spencer, with the comment of employer versus employee coercion, but the reality is during the pandemic, organizations had to give their employees agency to perform, and they did. They can't take that trust they've given their employees back. They need to leverage it by having a more thoughtful way of creating vibrant experiences. The examples you give, the things that we're talking about, these experiences matter, and they matter from a standpoint of being intentional actually drives real productivity organizationally. 
if employees are making a choice to be deliberate about their experience, whether it's going to an industrious office, whether it's coming into a CBD, whether it's working remote for the day, if they feel like they're being intentional in what they're being asked to do, they feel empowered to do great things. And I think organizations have to recognize they can shape these circumstances. So I've been speaking to every occupier I know. And one of them that I met with a couple of weeks ago said, we're giving all senior executives a office with their name on the door if they agree to come in three to four days a week. John, what's your point of view? I think it's an interesting idea. Um, I think it's a reflection maybe of where in workplace design, and let me mention this about most offices not being, you know, the beacons of good experience in the past, where things may have gone too far from an efficiency, from an open plan standpoint. Even if they're not assigning private spaces to individuals, we are seeing a lot of our clients introduce more private space than they would have in their last generation of planning. And so I think it's reflecting a true need for that type of workspace. Um, but it's also recognizing that um, it's, a, lot of, a lot of organizations are in a anything it takes moment. And if assignment is the way to get there, they probably will see the dominoes fall on senior leaders are in, middle, man, middle management's in, the whole crop of people who joined their company during the pandemic remotely is now coming in. And they may see some long-term benefits to that. I think it's easy to make those uh, types of allocation decisions as well when you feel like you have an entire portfolio to fill. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out when scarcity of space uh, becomes an issue again um, over the next few years. Yeah. And Spencer, I'm going to respond and say this. The biggest challenge in return to the office really isn't about the office at all. It's about flow. And what I mean by flow is Managers and their employees have to work in sequence, recognizing working in the office is different than working outside of the office. And I think smart organizations are empowering their managers to find ways to create flow with their teams. And what I mean by that is most are coming into the office right now, and because it's haphazard, because managers haven't really created flow on their teams, employees are coming back to the office, and they're working remotely together in the office for no benefit. Nobody likes that. The difference is when you create an experience and you create flow in your team and you recognize the days that you're in the office, that you manage your time differently, that you find the space in between meetings, that you take time out to socialize, those are all the things that make the proximity worth it, makes the connection meaningful. And then I can work remote some days, and I have a different flow in that. But I think the thing that organizations are failing to do is really enable that conversation around how we create flow to exist. Good managers pre-pandemic created flow in their teams. What the pandemic did is expose the fact that managers who didn't know how to create flow are struggling to do that with a more distributed workforce today. Jamie, turning back to you for a moment, what is industrious doing? Because we are in a new world today than where we were three, or maybe we're not. What is Industrious doing to get people in? So I think it's a few things. The first is, if you can afford it, hub and spoke models really work. The customers we see that have a mid-sized space or a HQ space in midtown Manhattan, but have an outpost in Soho, an outpost in Jersey City or Short Hills, and an outpost in Brooklyn, have people going in more like three or four, even five days a week. And that reveals that commuting is the thing people really don't want to do. So that can be a pain in the neck, but if you can pull off a hub and spoke model, people who want their employees in more like four or five days a week, the majority will. The second is the redesigns of the physical space that Lenny and John have described. There are things like more private spaces, creating more space for collisions that I do think are at this point very clear ways to pull people into the office. But the thing I would add that I think a lot of companies don't do is it's a mix of physical design, which the architects are all over, and your service program, which there's not much of right now. There's not an industry around that. There's not a good language around that. But if I go to Disney, Disney's very well designed. But the reason it goes so well is because there's also a ton of Disney employees making sure you're navigating the space right, making sure you're meeting other families, making sure you're taken care of. And I think if I got on a well-designed Delta Airlines airplane and it was unstaffed, it would be a free-for-all. And in the same way, one of the big things I notice is Industrious has obviously for many years been very highly staffed and they're trained in hospitality. And I think that makes a big, 
big, big difference. So people who want workplaces with very high utilization that people love need to staff it the way you would staff a hospitality product and train the people you would train hospitality employees and make it feel like the most inviting, welcoming place on earth. Think about what you just said there, Jamie. Training of your employees, heavily staffed. Putting aside the cost element of that, that is not physical space design. And so to Lenny, who is a trained architect, I think what Jamie is saying is that having the service element mastered through great training of your staff that provides that experience, maybe, I'm not going to say more important, but at least as important as the physical space. What do you think? At least as important for certain. And, yeah. and also other aspects. I mean, you can't reasonably predict all of the things people are going to need through physical space and technology solution alone. Somebody there to connect the dots, to unlock the investment in the space, and all of those other things to make that meaningful and to make the connection between the people on site real and felt. I absolutely agree with Jamie. You come to the office because it's an experience you can't have somewhere else. Experiences are hosted. And so having the host who can actually make that meaningful, I think differentiates a great workplace experience from one that people may not want to come to. Well, John, you're in the consulting group. You consult with some of the largest occupiers out there in the world, and they're dealing with this question, and they have a fixed budget. It's X dollars. Do I spend it on the materials I use for the lobby, or do I hire an extra employer to, to help you navigate the space that we've built? How do you handle that question? Well, I think the traditionally layers like technology or any OPEX-related item is easier to turn on, easier to turn off. It's easier to experience, experiment with things like that. Um, but really, I think the other problem that hybrid work and more flexible use of space introduces is one of coordination among employees, among teams, when they're going in, what they're doing when they're there, how to provision the space to be appropriate for that use. And that's where I think the connection between uh, a hospitality train, but also a team with high operational acumen that can set a space up, provide a good guest welcoming experience, deliver the catering for the day, but have that all be coordinated with the needs of what the meeting is or what the purpose for the actual people in there trying to work uh, is going to be, is a huge area of, of I would say, uh, high return on investment for fairly low cost. Spencer, I'll just I'll add to this. Preceding the pandemic, we looked at 10 years of occupancy information in New York. And what we found is year over year, people who put people in offices in New York were putting people in less square footage year over year, two to 3%. It was getting more efficient every year, meaning more people were getting put into less space. Now, if you accept that, that means less space to build out, less space to rent, more efficient. So you would think these organizations are lowering the cost of occupancy for each of those employees. But what was interesting during that same time, when we looked at the occupancy expense, meaning the cost per seat, it was going up year over year at the same time. So what was happening pre-pandemic is organizations were shifting investment from more space they were building out to better quality space, better services, better amenitized and appointed solutions for their employees. So this isn't new thinking. This is the pandemic accelerating that reality because now you have a consumer base of employees who demand better. And so I think that's what's accelerating all the things Jamie talked about. This investment, this reinvestment of taking things out of a lot of extra physical space we might not need and focusing in that into the things that people really want, which is a really rich and dynamic experience, again, was happening before the pandemic, but we think is going to happen with increased emphasis going forward. Well, there was a lot of things that Jamie said to unpack there, uh, but if you can deliver a individualized experience in what is a general space, I think that's where the magic is. I know that I visit offices at CBRE's network around the world, and a lot of times they'll have at, at the main screen, welcome Spencer Levy. Not that I'm special, it's just it's me, right? And it made me feel good, right? It made me feel better when they brought it with Dunkin' Donuts coffee, but... <laughs> And some of them actually do. But the point is, if you can individualize that experience within the general office design, is that the magic, John? I think it is. Um, you know, we've had several ideas come up just now of like yeah. things companies could try, um, either to personalize or to make that experience of going in uh, more impactful. But it's hard to know how far to go in that spectrum when you don't have a metric to measure it by. 
we've been exploring this idea of cost per visit with occupier clients, trying to understand the combination of real estate expense, rent, which is an OPEX category, uh, with traditional office management things, consumables, coffee, et cetera. But dividing that by the number of visits you're achieving to understand, okay, is lunch one more day a week expensive or not? Is hiring a new hospitality trained office manager expensive or not? If we get more visits because of it, and that metric trends in the right direction, you now have a measuring stick of what worked, what didn't. That concept has proven to be really powerful because it aligns the incentives of managing costs, which is always going to be important, especially in times of economic uncertainty, but also increasing visits and understanding the interventions and the impacts they're having. I think that the micro focus on real estate and the cost per visit, the cost of the space, is in some ways misdirected. Because the purpose of the organization is to be productive and to great, grow revenues. As an advisor to some of the largest occupiers in the world, how do you advise them on it? the efficiency versus the, okay, maybe you want to spend this extra dollar because it will make you more revenue? Well, if you look at just the, the dollar an organization spends, maybe 10 to 15% of that dollar is on real estate and 70 to 80% of that is on their people. So just the math is, firstly, focus on the big number, not the small number. The small number can unlock the big number, meaning if you make the right investments in that, you can enable your people. I do want to go back to this notion of just how we're thinking about anticipating and making people productive in the office. And there is one other aspect of this, which is metrics driven by data are informed by technology. And smart building technology today makes it so much easier to anticipate who's coming into the office, what they're doing when they're there, and what they value in terms of the spaces they use. In terms of looking at those things, there's inferences organizations can draw. If I'm trying to better integrate my organization, which is historically siloed, I can look at the nature of interactions that happen inside my office because I can measure what that actually is, what's happening in that space. I can draw inferences whether I'm being more or less successful in meeting that requirement. If I'm trying to create purpose and identity for a group of people who are working together, the frequency in which they come together in the office is a measurement that I can know. So I think smart building technology is creating a framework for really understanding experience. And I think from experience, organizations can draw out their conclusions of, are my strategic initiatives reflected in the way that my people are actually using the experience of the workplace that I'm providing them? And I think they draw conclusions whether they're being productive in that regard or not. I really agree with Lenny on this. He's mentioned technology a few times, and this is something I would say to listeners. On your point about post-pandemic, what are things that are different? I think there are a lot of customers, a lot of, a lot of companies that started using workplace apps in 2017, 2018, and they felt like it wasn't that important, or building apps, or sensors, And that has changed a lot. And unfortunately, there are companies that still think, oh, this is a strange accoutrement that no one really cares about. But the reality is that people are going to come in a few days a week. And sometimes they're going to work out of your main office space. And sometimes they're going to work out of the building common meeting area downstairs. And sometimes they're going to work from a spoke office in Brooklyn. That is impossible to manage without a digital infrastructure that sits on top of it. So a lot of these digital things that some customers still think of as, hey, I'm being sold on something that's a little bit ancillary or unnecessary. In the last years, it has become an absolutely fundamental part of navigating a modern workplace experience for your employees. So Jamie, we're just about out of time. So any final thoughts before you leave? One is, I don't want this to sound, you know, I've really enjoyed being on this. I've really enjoyed what you've said, what Lenny have said, what John has said. It has highlighted for me that, I think the types of things that you guys do are really essential for companies and they save companies money because I I don't want to knock architecture firms. There are some great ones, but the incentives are a little strange. They want you to spend as much as possible on building out an amazing show space and then they move on to their next project and they don't have to sit around and see how do people vote with their feet, what do they actually do And I think it's people who are in workplace and have to sit with the client and come back to the client a year later and say, did this work? Did this not work? Can we try something new? What I hear you talking about is stuff that's so close to what companies actually want. And I've learned a lot from you, even in the course of the last hour. So Lenny, uh, final thoughts. Uh, You come from an architectural background. We're talking workplace design. But I think Jamie's final comments really summed it up, is that we're dealing with a balancing act here of architecture and people that are... Uh, in the space, employees. But Lenny, you're an architect too. 
How do you respond to what Jamie said and any final thoughts? I'm going to take a deep track here because I would say what's most exciting about right now connects to the reason I'm in this business. Yeah. I've always thought about my job as much as a vocation, as a profession, meaning if we do what we do right, if we really think intentionally about the experience employees have, we make the world a better place. We make these people more connected, more supported. Workplace as a conversation inside organizations has never been more relevant than it is now. And it's with great responsibility and that, that vocation of being able to meet this moment and create a better world for people to go to work and be productive and be closer to their families and be successful in, in all the things that we would hope would come out of meeting this moment with a redefinition of how real estate actually supports a better world to live in. So, John, final thoughts. Uh, and again, uh, any additional thoughts on this? Two things. First, on micro markets, a lot of the examples of this we cited during the show uh, were built outside of the traditional CBD. Sometimes in, they required new subway lines to, to get to them. And now looking forward, we have really an infill opportunity uh, to create these in what have historically been vibrant places, some of our most culturally relevant cities around the country and around the world. Really, really exciting. Um, and second, we talked a lot about office today, um, but this is going to become a housing story before long. It kind of already is, maybe something for a different episode. Um, but the pandemic exposed a long-running uh, tension and constraint in our economy, which is that everybody had to live close to their job, close enough to commute every day. And not only did the houses have to be close to work, um, but each job needed a lot of office square footage, um, led to intense concentration of jobs, intense concentration of housing, a lot of waiting in traffic, a lot of rising housing costs, both really significant economically. With this constraint eased somewhat, plus the sort of monopoly of office on CBD being eased, upends everything about economic development and urban planning. Um, and it's definitely uncertain, but it's an exciting time and one I hope you'll look back on as central to creating a brighter, brighter future. So on behalf of The Weekly Take, I'm going to thank Lenny Bedoyan, Global Head of Workplace and Design CBRE. Lenny, thank you for coming back to the show again. Great job. Great pleasure. Thank you, Spencer. Jamie Hodari, CEO of Industrious. Jamie, terrific job today. Thanks for joining the show again. Thanks. And John Stevens, the Senior Director at America's Consulting CBRE. John, first time on the show. Well done. Appreciate it. For more, please visit our website, cbre.com slash the weekly take. You can share this episode and reach out to us with the talk to us button on our homepage. A simple click to send your thoughts or questions that we might follow up on in a future episode. And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you listen. We're taking off next week to celebrate July 4th, but we'll be back after the fireworks with episodes including expert insights on the capital markets at a crucial time of uncertainty and lots more. So enjoy your holiday. Hope to see you then. For now, thanks for joining us. I'm Spencer Levy. Be smart, be safe, be well.